I mean, I, I go back to the Cleckley's original stuff from the 40s and 50s, because Cleckley in studying sociopathy and psychopathy, he did it in, in psychiatric patients, whereas Bob Hare did it in prisoners. And, you know, so I went back and looked at that, the, you know, that the evolution of that, the, the idea of what is a psychopath and a sociopath. And, and I liked his thing. So the thing is, you just have to define what you mean. We'll call it A and B, but I like Cleckley's. And the first is the idea of a primary psychopath, which is what we call a psychopath. And the secondary psychopath is what we call a sociopath. And these are, they may do the same exact behaviors, but the reason why is completely different. And that's the interesting thing. So the people that said, no, they're not different. We, you know, we use different terms. It's really the same thing. It's not. So I, you know, these are two different animals. And it's just like you would separate out a disorder, like let's say OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, from the personality disorder part. You know, if you have OCPD, mm. well, you do we have all these obsessions and compulsions, but they're very different. Somebody who is just the OCD they know that they're crazy thoughts and delusions and urges. Somebody with OCPD, the, they think it's perfectly good. Their thing is, okay, you know, I'm, this is, I'm correct, you know, and, and these are very different, even though the behaviors in the report would be very similar. And the same thing with a, a psychopath and a sociopath, going from the original Cleckley view of it. And, 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 and with that, um, it, it would be somebody who is a, a sociopath knows what they're doing is wrong and they have a sense of moral reasoning they when they're caught many times they are embarrassed humiliated uh, they do any of many sociopaths real sociopaths will end up remorseful and but they also you know they have tells so you can see that they have something because they're nervous about it and they feel bad about it. So even though they'll do it anyway, they know it's wrong. So they have the same sort of moral compass that a normal person would have, but they, the difference is they go ahead and do it anyway. Now, the, in the Cleckleyan way, the psychopath, just like the dichotomy between OCD and OCPD, if you look at OCDPD, that's the personality disorder. And, the, and, and really the psychopathy is the per, personality disorder variant. You know, And, and so in that case, the true psychopaths, the primary psychopaths, they, they think what they're doing is really okay. They're not embarrassed about it. That's why they're so hard to catch. They have no tells because they really, in a very deep sense, don't think what they're doing is wrong. And so they have their own moral code, if, if, but it's not of the society or subculture or culture they're in. It's very much at odds with that. And so uh, they think it's okay and completely justified. That's when you hear, you know, people who are, uh, you know, the, if you go from the 1920s, the Fry Corp, or on the streets today, you know, like I was mentioning, people like Antifa, or people who are, who think what they're doing is justified, but it's not okay for the, everybody else. See, they would, if you really believe it, that's a form of psychopathy. So if you want psychopathy, which are people that really are, that create mayhem in people or groups' lives, and they think, no, I'm justified. That's more like psychopathy. So well, you don't have to go very far to see psychopathy today. You want in the street. But there are also psych you know, sociopaths out there too. And a sociopath um, is more like the pissed off loser, right? And this is kind of, it seems to be created, not like a psychopath. Primary psychopath, you know, it looks like you have to have a certain fraction of alleles, the forms of genes that uh, are, commensurate with those traits of psychopathy. Now, if you're not abused very early on between birth and two or three years old, usually birth to two, abandoned or abused, if you're not, you just have those traits because, you know, there's, you know, if you look at all the personality traits and then the, the complex adaptive behaviors, there's hundreds of them. These are, these are fundamentally determined by genetics but everybody has a different early experience. It's the very early experiences for psychopathy and for other personality disorders, the pernicious cluster Bs. And, and so they're where they've really been abused and they have the genes. This is the magic interaction of as everybody we know now, is, which is epigenetics. The, so this is, so in that case, the, the brain forms differently, the myelination patterns and the 
the regulators of those genes in the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. That's the social brain, the social and emotional brain, limbic system. And so those regulators of the genes, whether the promoters or the insulators, there's different regulators of the genes there, in that part of the brain are set kind of forever in either a, a, in an abnormal up position all the time, like always aggressive, you know, as opposed to being aggressive when you should be aggressive. Um, and, and so that's a more permanent thing. And you look at the brain, the connections, the myelination, the hardcore wiring is set pathologically forever. And therefore, this means that you, it, to fix a psychopath is a very low probability event because they're, they're, they're hardcore wired. It's not like their monomines are off because monomine pathways like dopamine, serotonin, they're very plastic anyway. And, you know, most of the pharmaceutical industry is based on manipulating monomines, which are plastic. But this, these personality disorders that are set down early, those are myelinated fiber tracks. They're, and, and that's hardcore. And so, so, so with the psychopath and with the other, uh, you know, the other cluster Bs, those things are set early. And so empathy, emotional empathy, not cognitive empathy, emotional empathy is, is, is always in a diseased state. You know, they don't have it like opposite of autistics. And, um, and so in, in the sense of, you know, aggression uh, for a normal person, it's perfectly fine to kill somebody. They come in to try to kill you or your, your family. Yeah, it's murder is okay. But in that case, it's called homicide, right? It just homicide is killing of one person by another. But, um, and so it's appropriate, but the psychopaths do inappropriate things. Now, if you look at what a sociopath is more complicated, because it looks like you may have somebody who really doesn't have the genetics for it, for these traits, but they're bullied when they're seven or eight, or they're extremely sexual and they're always refused it. It's like the young guy who is always attracted to the first kind of, kind of gal. And he, and he, and he, he ends up getting even with all women who look like that. And he kills them. And, and so that is more uh, a sociopath. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're, they seem to be more created later during the growth period after five to about 12 years old. That's when the bullying occurs, et cetera. Uh, but they, they, they have the same moral structure and moral reasoning as normal people. So in this, you know, in a very quirky, weird way, I guess, uh, a sociopath is a much worse person. That's where the evil is. Psychopath, you can't be evil if you think what you're doing is justified. It's not evil. So psychopaths aren't evil in this sense. It's, it, it, if you said that to somebody, they're going, what are you talking about? So they're just pure predators, man. They're just pure predators. You know, is a great white shark a, a sinner? No, no, no. They're scary, you know, they're, they're really scary, but they don't have, since they're not immoral. In this sense, the psychopaths aren't immoral and the sociopaths are. And, and so this is, you know, this kind of reasoning, a lot of people might, even some clinicians, might reject this. Because first of all, it makes one group, you can't ever fix them. And there's not a clinician in the world that wants to hear that, right? I can do it, I can fix them and everything, but I've yet to see this happen. Everybody can change. You know, we have a lot of people who promise to change on January 1st every year. And it lasts for about seven days. Everybody's wonderful and they have a, they have a free will for seven days. And then they're, they're right back at, you know, hitting the sauce or hitting, hitting the pumpkin pie. And so uh, even the same with alcoholics, or, you know, addicts, everybody's got this thing where I have, you know, you have free will, but only maybe for a few days or a few, a couple of months, you know? And so this is the imperative, it seems of this. So, and you, you get this with, with the psychopaths and sociopaths, they do it in cycles too, almost like in regular rhythms. But I look like, especially for a psychopath, like an addiction. And so, so these are different ways you can look at these, at least in the, you know, uh, the way you know, I do and the group I work with does, but not everybody does. Everybody's got a different angle on this.